Welcome to the Brainstorm, episode 96, closing into our final 100th episode, where Dick and I will make the determination whether to continue on or wrap it all up, unless we get enough funny comments. So please, com- comment away. We've got Shay Wilberg with us from our genomics team. Shay's first time joining us. Shay, do you want to give a, a quick intro? Sure. So Shay Wilberg, I recently joined here at ARK Invest as a multi-omics analyst on the team. Before this, I was working over on the cell side over at Barclays doing equity research over there. Education-wise, I have a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology. So looking forward to it. Super happy to have you. (laughs) All right, Shay. We spoke in brainstorm. We are excited. Dr. Prasad, as the chief medical and science officer, going to shake things up at the FDA. Now we blink our eyes. Three weeks later, he's out. What 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 happened? What are the implications? Um, and how are you thinking about it? Yeah, it's been a dizzying episode over the last few weeks. Here we just, as you highlighted, had him come in just a few months ago, and now here he is, already out of the FDA. So. Just to highlight, so the FDA is the regulatory agency that handles drug and biological approvals for things like gene therapies. And so here we had this saga over July here about a gene therapy from a company known as Repta Therapeutics that is approved for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is a devastating disease, progressive muscle wasting. And unfortunately, these patients often have a shorter lifespan and may pass away even as early as in their 20s. So we have a drug here that's approved for this devastating uh, condition, and it was um, shown that it had two patient deaths in teenage boys. Now, this is a real safety concern, and so it was halted for these um, older patients that no, no longer walk, and it was still allowed to be sold to patients that are younger that can walk. So what ended up happening here is we found out that there was a third patient death for a different type of muscular dystrophy, and the FDA's response to this was to say, We want you to halt all shipments. So so Sarepta responded saying, we're not going to do that. They took the weekend, reconsidered, and posted on Monday that they would halt all shipments. Now, as you can imagine, this caused some backlash. Remember, this is a very devastating condition for these patients. So the Duchenne muscular community, patient advocacy groups were obviously very devastated. Now they're losing this option for something that could potentially halt or even reverse progression for these patients. Um, In the mix of all of this, we're having some potential um, controversy from a political standpoint. So there are right-wing commentators uh, postulating that he's a saboteur here at the FDA. He's potentially bringing in leftist ideology. And, you know, there's this just this perfect storm, if you will, of all these things with this Repta conflict, potential political headwinds here. You know, unclear to say how much contribution that was. But here we have... Um, the FDA's turnaround saying, please continue shipments for these ambulatory or patients that are younger that can walk. And Prasad is out the next day. So taking away from this, well, in the interim, we'll have the acting um, director for the Department of um, CIDR. So this is the agency division that handles drug approvals. Or um, so, in com- so he'll be uh, regulating both the drugs and the biologics in this interim period. In terms of the long-term appointment, I think what we can probably expect is that this is still Macari's FDA. So Macari is the FDA commissioner, the head of the FDA, and he's outlined a very clear vision for us on what he wants to do with the FDA, and that's really kind of recalibrate standards here. We want to have more efficient regulatory pathways. It shouldn't have to take potentially 10 plus years to get a drug approval. Then costs are escalating. How can we leverage AI, big data, to make this process more efficient. He's been very vocal about wanting to really improve the FDA and be an ally with the industry and getting these very important drugs through to patients who need them. So I think we can expect that the incoming head for cyber, the division, so the one that handles biologics, will probably share these same priorities. So it's been a dizzying episode, and so we'll stay tuned to see what happens further with the FDA. Okay, going back to the Sarepta um, trial, is it clear what led to the deaths in these two patients and then I, you know, the third that you mentioned as well, or is it not clear and that's why they wanted to pause shipments? Yeah, so that's a really important question. So these two patient deaths were in teenage boys and it was linked to acute liver failure. So this is a you know, powerful viral gene therapy 
that can cause, um, you know, basically uh, a liver failure in these patients. So it's a very important to handle the post mark or the post treatment with immunosuppressive regimens to help these patients tolerate it. Um, so what we've seen is in these older patients that may have a higher total dose, right? Because it's done by uh, per kilogram basis. So these are larger patients that they may be more susceptible to these kinds of outcomes. Um, so they asked, you know, let's do some more monitoring and figure out um, how to move forward and making sure that we can have a, you know, a more safer regimen for these patients. This is different from um, the ambulatory patients. So these are younger patients that can walk. So we didn't see a patient death that was linked to the gerin therapy in these patients. Got it. And zooming out, do you think because you mentioned AI drug discovery, do you think that you can embed AI into the process of clinical trials as well, as in maybe you can also simulate some of this using AI large language models to be able to not have this get to human trials before you know more of these avenues are explored so you don't have potential patient deaths? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. There's lots that you can do to leverage and they've been vocal about how can we leverage these tools to improve success in clinical trials. As you highlight, how can we make sure that we have the right fit for the therapy to the right patients? So there's lots of ways that both on the industry side that they're looking for how to leverage AI um, to improve that process and both on the industry, excuse me, on the agency side, looking about how can they improve their own processing, how can we streamline the regulatory pathway and better design the clinical trials, um, better select patient biomarkers. So there's lots of different ways and different avenues to approach this so that we potentially have a better success rate so we get the right drugs to the right patients and in a faster process. And then, Shay, maybe zooming out and, and away from the story itself, because we have you on for the first time, it would be great to get your kind of l l maybe long-term take and what you're most excited for within the um, you know areas that you're focused on from a research standpoint. Like, what is one area that maybe we haven't talked about enough or has been overlooked that you're starting to do more and more research on? Well, I guess if I can break it out into two ways, if we think about just on the concept of kind of what we were talking about before with the FDA, I think there's a lot to be excited here about in terms of what the rhetoric has been in terms of what they want to do to improve the FDA and being an ally to innovation, um, you know, such as commentary about approving rare disease therapies at the first sign of promise. A lot of these patients that have rare diseases don't have any meaningful disease modifying option. So to get drugs to these patients, sooner is really important. Early intervention is really important. If you think more about in terms of, you know, the broader view in terms of developments and the different kinds of biologics or drugs that are coming through in the space, you know, there's lots of exciting developments in therapeutics. I think one thing that we're seeing that's going to become more important and meaningful over time is this idea that, you know, thinking on the context here of gene therapies, um, the idea that we can do gene editing not just for rare diseases, but potentially for very common, broad diseases. And I think that's going to be really transformative. Um, so we've already seen the proof of concept here in rare diseases. I think we're going to see it very soon for very common diseases, including things like cardiovascular disease. Mm. And what companies are working on the common disease uh, problem with gene therapies? Yeah, I can highlight one key example, actually, that we're focused around, and that's CRISPR therapeutics. So they're developing gene editing therapies that can address just this, right? Moving from not just, you know, success in rare diseases, but also very common conditions such as cardiovascular disease by targeting genes that play a very important role in liver metabolism. So I think we're going to see something very soon. We've already seen very encouraging proof of concept phase one data, and I think we'll see more to come. Fascinating. Fascinating stuff. Sam, anything else on your end? No, and thank you for uh, taking over there. My internet is quite jumpy today, now which isn't good. isn't great. Oh, now I'm good. That's great. Yeah. Um, no, I think I think that covers it. It's like, is it correct to distill that the FDA is willing? It it's like really this was a move to keep innovation going forward, and that he was seen as a potential obstacle to that, or is that too explicit? 
Well, I think it's a little bit speculation, right? So we don't know. We haven't actually been behind the full closed doors. And the way that they have communicated themselves is that he didn't want to be a distraction under the Trump administration. He was decided to return back to California. Some commentary around, you know, it's a pretty hard commute. Uh, but so I think, you know, I don't know that we're going to ever get a real full picture. But I think one thing's for sure that we can see that this that there's this drama that we saw here with disruptive therapeutics around their gene therapy. And it's possible that this provided an inflection point, you know, maybe from a political standpoint as well. But I think, you know, what we've heard here is very consistent messaging you know, from this new FDA, if you will, about really wanting to facilitate innovation. And I think that's going to continue. I think that's the key thing. Yeah, I mean, it really does seem like no one wants to catch a falling knife and genomics broadly has been, you know, the knife that has, has been falling, but it's like more and more the things that we're hearing, the alignment from the regulatory side, which is a big piece of the story beyond just the science is starting to align. And so, you know, I think it would be a mistake for people to assume that, uh, the knife, the knife hits the floor, right? It's like, uh, it's becoming more and more exciting as, as it gets lower and lower and it's been low for so long, you know, everything does seem to be aligning in a very exciting way uh, at this point in time. Yeah, I fully agree. It's a, it's a complex area, right? These are very complex products that are being developed and pushed through, but they're really, really important. Um, these are things that can be life-saving for people. Um, so we really want to, you know, really hoping for, and we're seeing lots of elements coming into place, whether it's the FDA really trying to say, how can we improve this process from our own standpoint? all these transformative aspects in terms of drug development. How do we incorporate things like AI to better improve the process? And they're all kind of coming into place now. So I think we're at a really uh, exciting inflection point. Shay, I have one last question slash statement that I'd love to get your take on. And I think it boils down to what you're both saying, which is why now? Why I get excited about genomics now? And do you think it's fair to say that the reason it's, you know, we're at this inflection point is because of the advances we're seeing with AI and how you can apply that to a very complex industry that needs potentially personalization down to the individual to be able to combat these rare diseases um, with gene editing tools. Is that, you know, something that you think is really the big unlock here and why to be very excited about genomics now versus maybe prior years where we didn't have this technology. Yeah, no, I think you hit the nail on the head, Nick. I think it's really hard to understate the importance here. We are opening avenues of things that were completely previously impossible. You know, you could put all the scientists to work on a problem and we're starting to reach a point where we can surpass what was previously possible. And I think it's just going to continue to accelerate, right? I think we all can appreciate that. So what we could achieve in terms of better designing um, targets that you may have for a particular disorder, um, being able to find ways to go through preclinical studies faster. Maybe you don't always need to have animal models, for example, uh, being able to better design a clinical trial to better have a rigorous testing. Um, I think there's just so many different elements we're going to see that come into play. That's going to be really important. Wow. Well, exciting times. Yeah. Exciting times. <laughs> Well, Shay, thank you so much for coming on. Um, it was a pleasure, and hopefully, yeah. we'll have you back soon. The first, the first of many. You've made a, yeah. you've made a great uh, early entrance as uh, explainable genomics. So, <laughs> perfect. Yeah, my pleasure. So happy to come back on whenever. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Shay. Right. Thanks so much. Bye.